Okay, um, so I can get a sense of which bits to focus on and which bits to skip over. Um, who here has used Tika before? Okay. Um, just so you all know, hands up if you're currently a committer on Tika, so you know who to bug <laughs> afterwards. Okay. <laughs> um, and for you guys using Tika, would you say, hands up if you feel you're kind of an advanced user on the latest stuff? Okay, right. So I'll try and focus a bit more on some of the new things we've put in, um, some of the changes we're making, some of the things that we are about to break on too, all that sort of stuff. So, um, Tika, we kind of like to think of it as a Babel fish for content. Help you figure out what the hell this file is, then how to get some metadata out, how to get some text out, and how to avoid the complexity that normally goes along with getting useful stuff out of 100 different kinds of files. Um, Tiki has been in the news recently. So Panama Papers, hopefully everyone heard about those. Got some nods. Yeah, so the guys who did all the investigation on the Panama Papers used Tika for their text and metadata extraction. They used Apache Solar for the indexing. Um, and then they used uh, Neo4j for finding some of the links. Um, it's really cool. What we'd love is if they would share with us the most common stack traces of the failures. <laughs> but at the moment, they're being a little bit sensitive even on that. And then Memex is a DARPA-funded project to try and increase the ability of indexing and finding things on the dark web. Um, I think what they thought they were buying in the procurement and what they actually got aren't quite the same. So there's been an awful lot of work on indexing new kinds of scientific data sets that definitely increases the percentage of the dark web indexed, but maybe wasn't quite what they had in mind. But there's also some really cool stuff that I'll mention later about trying to index uh, videos and index um, images and work out what's in those. Um, also need to shout out that Tomorrow, Tim is going to be talking a lot more on the Tika eval stuff, which is, on the whole, did this get better or worse when I applied a patch? So I'm going to skip some of the slides I would normally have done on that and direct you to go to Tim's talk. Or otherwise, um, at exactly the same time, sadly, we've got David North talking on some of the work that's been going on with Apache POI, especially a lot of the work that Tika has been doing that's come back into POI to support it. So, first up, a little bit of history. Why, why does Tika even exist? So, who remembers building their own web spider from scratch in about 2003, 2004, 2005? It was awesome, wasn't it? Um, you know how you'd kind of just go on some wiki and find this snippet of Java code that might or might not work with Word, and then you'd try and get it to compile on the right version of something, and then your boss would be like, why, why can I not find my slides? You'd be like, oh, because that's PowerPoint and that's different. And there was just, there were just like snippets of code on mailing list posts and on wikis, some of them relating to Lucene, and there were bugs, and it was just absolute nightmare. Um, alternately, you could have gone out and bought something for a massive pile of cash that would have fallen over quite a lot and not scaled and probably had most of the same bugs in. Um, and so there was a lot of reinventing of the wheel badly with three sides and, yeah, generally a mess. Um, so the Apache Nutch project, who were trying to do the um, web scale indexing and searching, who also went on to invent Hadoop, um, were just as fed up as everyone else with this state of affairs, but they were in a slightly better position to fix it. So they teamed up with the Apache Lucene group and took a lot of these snippets of random bits of code and um, a bit of code from another project called Lewis and then produced Tika as a way of hiding that complexity and having a stable place in subversion where you could go to fix, which is a lot easier than trying to post bug fix to a piece of code on a mailing list post. So the project was founded in 2007, um, went into the incubator, graduated in 2008, version one in 2011, and we're now in 2017, six years later. So project has moved on a long way in that time. There's quite a lot of people out there we find who used T 
Tico 0.9, 1.0, 1.1, and I'm like, yeah, this is quite good, doesn't quite do everything I need. And then they sometimes come back to the project and say, what the hell has happened? Why has the jar file grown? <laughs> <laughs> what is all this stuff that's turned up? So that's what I'm going to try and cover today. Um, also, if anyone knows how to get a really good graph in OpenOffice where one of the axes goes past 1.9, I'd love to know. But this kind of gives you an idea of the, the releases we've done. They, they keep coming out. 1.15, probably going to start in another day or two. I think we've all agreed that the regressions are minor enough that we can go ahead and do that. So maybe you'll see that next week. So some of the supported formats. You know, we've got the usual kind of easy ones, the text-based ones. Then we've got all the Microsoft Office ones. We've got open document, we've got iWorks, we've got loads of compression formats, we've got publishing formats, we've got audio, we've got image. Most of the things you're going to want to work with. Um, it's features detection. Working out what the hell something is. Um, so that can be based on the file name, it could be based on the start of the file, it can be based on opening the file up and peeking inside it and combining all those together. You may say, well, surely I know what this file that I created on my computer is. And you probably, but not always, be right, as anyone who's dealt with a .xls file that had been renamed from a CSV. A file that someone else created on your computer or created on your company's shared drive? Less so. A file from the internet? <laughs> probably no hope. So. We have to do this detection to work out what this thing is. Um, and then you can do that just standalone. So I know that some of the digital forensics people and also some of the people doing mail scanning use Tika for that. And they just say, this thing that says it's a Word document, is it a Word document or a Word document with macros or a screensaver? And you can say, hmm, well, it's a Windows executable. Probably not what you wanted to pass through in this mail attachment. So you can use it for that. Um, so metadata, describing the file, you know, who wrote it, what's the title of it, where was it created, what location is it, what is it describing. <coughs> and what Tika tries to do here is hide that complexity. So you don't need to know that it's created at or created on or first created timestamp or the last entry in a created modified stream. Tika hides that from you, tries to keep you back, something that says, the thing that's logically described by Dublin Core Creator, Tim. <coughs> um, T can give you back the plain text for most of the file formats. Um, and it wraps up all the different libraries, all the different executables, hides all that from you. So that's really uh, aimed at things like full text indexing. For this thing I've got, give me something I can give to Lucene. Um, and then it can also give you XHTML. This is not the same as Word, save as HTML. It is simplified and aims to be semantically meaningful. So we will throw away an awful lot of stuff and hopefully keep just the things you care about. This is a div that is a heading with some text in. This is a div that has some text and an image. Um, it can be used for simple previews, but that's kind of it. Um, but the idea is that you can say, for this document, I don't care about the header and footer. Show me what's left. For this document, um, is there a table of contents? If so, can I grab the table of contents? So that you can work out roughly what's in it and get the bits that you want, but not to have a really high fidelity web preview of the document. Um, so our, our, our kind of architecture or sort of mission statement is to hide the complexity, to hide the difference, to try and pick the best library, code snippets, executables for you, to work with upstream for you to fix bugs and get enhancements done, and to generally come with batteries included, except where that would cause you massive surprises, and then to come with batteries nearby. So when we're looking at adding new formats, new libraries, we say, what's that going to do to the jar size? And if the answer is, it's going to go up from 50 megabytes to 2 terabytes, we say, maybe, guys, we should put that machine learning data set in a REST service 
and just ship a very thin shim that will let you talk to it, where you can opt in to that massive training data set. Um, whereas if it's like, oh, well, it's going to add half a megabyte, okay, well, we'll probably put it in line. So most things are going to be supported out of the box. The other things, there's going to be a way to turn on the big chunky things if you want them, but not on by default. We try and support the JVM users and the non-JVM users as near equals. And if we get it wrong, tell us and we'll fix it. If you say, hey, I think this thing should be in a standard and it doesn't have a big impact, great, we'll do it. If you say, hey, you said you were going to hide the complexity, but I've just seen this nasty PDF artifact turning up, well, we'll, we'll try and fix that. So let us know. So what's new? The biggest thing, for those of you who have not used Tika for a while, is the number of file formats that we support, number of passes. So we've got HTML, XML, Microsoft Office. We've now got Word, PowerPoint, all Excel versions since version 2. Uh, Visio, Outlook, we've got all the weird XML formats that were pre xml uh, Tim's done a lot of work getting those in, so the Word ML, Spreadsheet ML kind of stuff. And we now even have support for lock files, tell you who locked the file. Then we've got ODF, we've got iWorks, we've got WordPerfect in there now, PDF RTF. Um, we work with Commons Compress, and every time I do this slide, the list of supported compression and archive formats gets longer. And I worry that on the next one, it's not even going to fit on one line. Um, but they're doing some really great work, and we've been working with them recently. Um, we do help. We do a lot of audio formats now. So we've got MP3, MP4, Ogvorbis, Speak, Theora. So most of those ones, we're only able to get the metadata out. We don't do any audio transliterate, um, sort of ASR. ASR. Yeah, we don't do that. But we can say, hey, this is an MP3 of a talk given by Dave Fisher in 2011, and it's in 16-bit mono. We can give you all that kind of thing. Um, images, support for almost all the images you can think of to get the metadata, and also where supported, we can do OCR. And then for the video, we can do the metadata, and we can also do some histograms if you want for some similarity stuff. Source code, all the major email formats, um, lots and lots of scientific formats. Uh, we can do executables, and we'll tell you, hey, this is an executable for 64-bit Windows, or this is an executable for Linux on 64-bit ARM, little endian, shared libraries, all that kind of thing, which is just in interesting if you want to know what the thing is, and also, should I let this through? Um, we've got some crypto formats in there now, and we've got a number of database formats that we're able to get the data out of. So, OCR. Um, if you've got an image, you might want to find the things in it. And if it's just an image, that's going to be kind of hard. So OCR comes to the rescue here. And the thing we work with is an open source tool called Tesseract. Anyone come across Tesseract before? It's not quite as fast as some of the commercial toolkits because they've optimized the code for readability, understandability, and ability for PhD students to work on adding cool new features. So there's a few bits where people have gone, hey, can I rewrite this chunk in uh, Assembler so it's faster? And they've gone, no. What we care about is that the next PhD student to come in can do some really cool new stuff without us having to go back to you to get it rewritten in Assembler. So it's not as fast as some of the commercial toolkits, but it is moving on at a pretty good pace. It's the new version of Tesseract that's come out that's just done a whole load of new detection things that have come in. So Tika's got a parser that will call out to Tesseract. At the moment, Tika will silently use Tesseract if it finds it, which can cause surprises because if you've got a French document and you've got a default Tesseract install, it's going to run really slowly to no benefit because by default, it won't have that language pack. So we are currently debating changing that default to avoid surprise. It's the trade-off between avoid surprise and batteries included. Um, but it's there. It's very easy to turn on. Um, the one thing that we are still deciding the best way to do, and we'll hopefully fix in 2.0, is make it easier for you to say, I want to have the metadata from 
this image parser and I want to have it go through Tesseract to get the text out. And by the way, I also want this to happen when it's an image embedded in a PDF. So some of those things we're, we're trying to get a little bit better. Container formats, uh, a really fun one here. You do detection, you say it's a zip file. So that could just be a zip, but maybe that's um, an ODF file which is stored within a zip. Maybe it's a PowerPoint PPTX file. Uh, maybe it's an EPUB. There's loads of different file formats that live inside these containers. Equally, you can have a look at something and say, well, this is, um, this is an AVI container. OK, well, that's probably going to be video. OK, what about if it is um, uh, the OG framing format? Well, is that going to be OG Vorbis? Or is that going to be Theora? Or is that going to be the weird thing where you get the audio and the text for karaoke? I can't remember what that one's called. But you know, there's all these different things that can live within these containers. That makes detection hard, because you're saying, is this audio or video or something else? And Tika's got to actually unpack the container and peek inside and say, well, it's OG, and it's got a stream of metadata and a stream of audio. OK, that's probably an audio file. Or look inside and say, hey, this is a, this is a zip file, but I found a content types file, and I found a Word subdirectory. This is probably going to be a Word docx file. But that's a more expensive process to do the detection. Um, but often, that's going to be what you want to have. You don't want to just say, well, it's a zip and it ends in docx. I'm going to trust that that's a docx, especially uh, if you want to do text passing or you want to do any digital forensics. You actually care what it is, not what it looks like. Databases we've got um, support for. Um, a surprising number of the database systems have a single file mode. Um, Teak is not currently able to work on the thing where you say, this disk contains my Microsoft SQL Server database strewn across 3,000 files. Tika's not going to be able to help there. <clears throat> but for SQLite, for Access, for some of those things where there's a single file, you can give that to Tika, and Tika can give you back the textual content of that database so that you can index it and find things in it. Um, still having a bit of debate about the best way to represent the contents of those databases in XHTML such that they make sense and they're easy to search for. Um, and generally, for a lot of these file formats, you're going to have to drop an extra jar or an extra library on your class path to make it activate, because those tend to be pretty chunky ones. And people get a bit grumpy if the Tika jar file jumps by 200 megabytes worth of shared libraries for four different platforms. Tika config XML is relatively new in the current way of working, but it just lets you say, hey, I want to turn off these parsers, and I want to turn on this language translation, and I want to tweak the priority of these things. So you can say what parsers to use, what detectors to use, what parsers not to use. You can manually wire in some extra mind types to parsers. Um, you can do it explicitly, and you can do it implicitly with the default. So you say, I want default Tika config, except that I want to turn off OCR. And that's easy. Um, if you use the Tika app, it can tell you what your config currently is, and it can translate between the different modes. So you can say, Tika app, take my custom config file here and tell me explicitly what it resolved into. Or Tika, tell me what the default one is in explicit mode so I can then go through and manually turn some bits off. And it looks kind of like this. Fairly boring, but hopefully you can read through it and, and see what's going on. Embedded resources are a fun one. Um, if you've got a zip file that has three files in, you know, three images, OK, well, so the file is the zip, and the embedded resources are these three separate images in it. That's relatively clear. Um, if you've got a PDF that's scanned, to you as a user, you say, well, the thing I've got is a PDF, and it's got three pages. And then we look at it and go, well, you've got a PDF with no text, and you've got three embedded images. OK? If you've got a PowerPoint file with a graph, that's normally a PowerPoint file with an embedded Excel file and a quick rendered version of that Excel file as the graph. So is that 
PowerPoint file, or is that a PowerPoint file with an image, or is that a PowerPoint file with an image and an Excel file, if they're both representing the same thing, but one's a preview and one's the original, which one do you care about? The Tika approach is to say, here's what I've got, tell me which ones you care about. Um, and the default is often just to give you everything. But be aware that Tika sometimes doesn't have a really easy answer and has to turn to you and say, I've got some stuff and I'm not sure which ones you're going to be interested in. You tell me what you want and I'll carry on with those. The Tika app is a single runnable jar that I think is well, it's about 60 meg at the moment. And mostly batteries included, and you can say, Tika, what is this thing? And it will run, tell you the detection, you can get the metadata, you can get the text content out. Um, and it also has a nice little GUI mode that you can use for testing. Just drag and drop a file onto it and see what you get out. It's really easy to get started with. It's really easy to use from non-JVM languages, but you're spawning a new JVM every time. So there's going to be some scaling issues. So use it for testing, use it for demos, use it for one-offs. Probably don't bake it into the middle of your high production pipeline. We've got the Tika server for that, which is um, a RESTful server that you can just talk to. You say, Tika, I want the metadata. Here's the upload the file. Back you get the metadata. Um, and it's also, if you go to it in a web browser, it will tell you all of the different endpoints it supports. And then we've got some really nice browsable documentation on the website so you can see. Um, on the whole, we think all of the things you might want to do with Tika in Java are exposed through the server, we think. If there's something that you're trying to do that the server doesn't support, let us know, and we can generally really quickly add in another endpoint to expose that. But if you're talking to Tika from another language that's not JVM based, this is definitely the way to go. And sometimes even from Java, you might want to go with this. OSGI, any OSGI users in the house? OK. We have bundles. That man there makes sure they're awesome. Talk to him afterwards. Tika batch is an easy way to run Tika across a large number of files. Um, it's multi-threaded. Um, it's not yet Hadoop enabled. We're currently talking about whether we want to take all the advice currently on the wiki on how to make Tika run well on Hadoop and do a Hadoop version, or whether we're going to do some cool stuff with Docker containers and Kubernetes and just spin up a whole bunch of instances of it to run. But the basic idea is starting from a directory of stuff, run as best you can, give me the metadata, give me the embedded resources, give me the text, tell me what failed. Um, so it'll record the failures, it will respawn things that, that die, it will kill things to avoid out of memories and memory leaks, all that kind of stuff. So it just kind of runs through and says, this is what I could get, and this is what failed. Um, you can then, if you want, import that. So if you've got a massive bunch of documents that you're going to want to ingest in, you can use Tika Batch to process and then grab all the text, load it in. Or you can use it with Tika Reval, which Tim's talking about tomorrow, to say, on the whole, did this patch make things better or worse? Named entity recognition. Um, anyone done any natural language processing? Any of that stuff? So Tika's got some plugins for that where you can say, this piece of text, does it talk about anyone? And it will say, OK, so this piece of text here, it's talking about Nick Birch. And so it can grab bits of text and turn them into metadata. So rather than you then go, well, here's this text of the talk, it can say, well, the title was what's new in Apache Tika. Even though it wasn't put in the explicit metadata, we've managed to pull out that the author is Nick Birch and the location is Miami, Florida, and all these things. Um, one specific batteries included version of this is Grobid, which is aimed at scientific papers. Um, and so it's based on natural language processing, name entity recognition, machine learning, and a hefty training data set. And the idea is that you can give it a PDF of a scientific paper, a technical paper, and it knows how to pull out the citations, the authors, the titles, all that kind of stuff as metadata, so that you can give it a PDF 
and back will come. All that information is metadata available for you to index, for you to search on. Um, that's all done via a REST API because the size of it was too big with that training data set. But if you're interested, that's all about Grobid. And the second one explains how to turn it on, how to, how to grab the Grobid data set and how to turn on the REST API. Geoentity lookup is quite a fun one. Um, if you take the text here, this was written in Seville, Spain in November, it can then spot that Seville, Spain is a place and look up the latitude and longitude so that you could take a piece of text that doesn't have latitude and longitude the same way that a geotagged image does and do a look up and work out that this document is describing a place and get that into metadata. Um, and that's powered by um, Apache Lucene and the GeoNames database. If you were thinking of doing some sort of cool named entity recognition stuff and lookups, have a look at the source code for this. It's actually a really good template for how can I hook in um, the named entity recognition and also some quick lookups and, and get useful stuff out. So if you were going to do custom things, that would be my recommendation of a place to start. Image object recognition. This is stolen straight out of one of Chris Matman's papers. Um, but the idea is that you use image recognition on images or stills of videos, and you try and work out through machine learning what the image is talking about, and then pull that out into metadata or into text so that you can do searching for it. So rather than say, I've got an image, it was taken in Miami, it's 600 pixels wide, you can say, I've got an image that's 600 pixel wide taken in Miami, Florida, that is about a beach. And then you can do searching and say, I want things within 500 miles of Orlando that feature beach. OK, here's this image. Or if you're in law enforcement, I want images taken within 500 miles of Kabul featuring weapons. I want YouTube videos where at least one of the stills seems to reference Afghanistan and guns. So it's all powered by um, some pretty cool machine learning stuff to do the image recognition. It's quite slow, um, but it does work. That's the paper reference down there that I've stolen all this stuff from. Um, if you were going to be doing it on videos, it's often recommended to do some video analysis and find stable points and then only process those stable points rather than trying to do every single frame of the video where things are moving around. Maybe just wait till the camera stops and hope that that's something important. Process one of those and wait until it moves on again. Um, which feeds into the text searchable video. Um, one of the things is the pooled time series analysis that decomposes it into an object space and a histogram space. A little hand wavy. I saw a talk on it, but I didn't fully understand it. The, the idea is to be able to find similar videos. Find me videos that are like this one. Find me videos that have a section a bit like this section. Uh, so if you're doing some of the dark web stuff, I have a video here of someone I'm quite interested in. Can you see if you can find some other videos that feature this person? Um, or you can do it for recommendation stuff. Hey, the user really liked this short clip. It's too short to have any more data in. Maybe we haven't got enough viewers to do the Netflix similarity stuff. But can you find me other videos like this? Because maybe it's my kid's favorite TV character, and I want to know other videos that feature this same character. Um, it does matrix transformation stuff, and it does some decomposition into text to do the similarity. And if you're interested, um, you can read that paper. Or if you want something a bit more friendly, see the talk that Chris gave two years ago when he started working on a lot of this stuff. Anyone do stuff with medical or pharmaceutical? OK, Apache CTEX is a really interesting project that tries to be a batteries included example of all the natural language processing, named entity recognition work. And most of what they ship is a pre-computed training data set for the natural language processing. And most of the work they do is writing the code that is used to generate these data sets. 
Um, and then Tika can hook into that so that you've got your text that says, I took some aspirin and my headache went away. And it can say, okay, you're talking about this specific drug here and you're talking about this medical condition and this effect. And the sentiment was positive, not negative, not saying I took some aspirin and things got worse. So if you're interested in doing any analysis on medical or pharmaceutical stuff, then the CTEX integration is really good because it takes the text and pulls out the metadata and tells you more about what's going on in the document. Apache Camel, have we got any Camel users? Okay, you want to upgrade to 2.19. Um, Bob did some work in the last couple of weeks on getting the integration in there so that you can send your files and uh, directories through into Tika and get the information back out. Have a chat with him after, he'll tell you more. Um, translation. <coughs> Tika's now got hooks into a number of different uh, translation services. It's not baked into Tika, it's a hook out to various REST-based services. But you can say, Tika, if you find documents that are in Spanish, can you please get the metadata translated for me into English? So Tika knows that this thing here is a title and it knows that it's in Spanish and it says, okay, well, I'll go off and contact one of these translation services and get the metadata translated or the content translated. So that then you, when you're saying, I want to find documents where the title is talking about, um, what's going to be a good example, London, then it will pick up a document that was in Spanish talking about Londres, even though that's not the same word because you've got the translation. So if you're dealing with lots of documents in languages that you, don't, you yourself don't speak and you're trying to find things, um, then that can be really handy. If it's your users who speak that language searching for it, it doesn't matter. Your Spanish users will be searching for Londres, not London. So they'll find that original Spanish document. But if you're dealing with documents where you don't speak, where you want to find things, then hooking in this translation stuff gives you an easy way, batteries included, to find out what's going on. Um, needed for that is the language detection stuff. This piece of text, what is it in? Um, if you want to play with this, do not type hello world. Almost all the language detection stuff is statistical based and it needs a certain length of document. One or two words, not going to be enough to work out the language. Several paragraphs, it's going to be great. So please try two paragraphs worth of email, not two words if you want to test how well we're going to do on it. Um, Tika's now got a couple of different ones that you can play with um, for the detection that's all configurable. Um, another thing we've done recently to try and help you all is troubleshooting. Go to this wiki page, start, and it describes all the common problems, and then it walks you through the process of figuring out what's gone wrong, and at certain points says, please tell the mailing list, please open a bug, you've hit a real thing. But often it just says, you're not getting any text out. Try doing this, try seeing what passes you've got, make sure that you've got the passes you expected. Okay, you've not got a parser, go here, see how the configuration works, see how to get that parser configured in. <coughs> Hopefully, covers most of the main queries, if not, we can add to it. Um, and then if you're writing parsers, we've tried to document a bit more about how parsers should work when things go wrong. So, last couple of releases. Um, in 1.12, we did some work to make the two different PowerPoint formats behave more similarly so that the XHTML you got back for two identical documents in the two formats was closer which makes it easier if you're trying to make sense of them. We've done a whole load of work on the named entity stuff. Then in 1.13, loads and loads of bug, uh, loads and loads of upgrades for bug fixes. We did a lot of new scientific formats for detection, and then we made it easier for you to do the config loading and, and dumping. Um, 1.14, we started to do some more work on giving you the macros back from documents, so you can see what what's in the, the macros, get access to them. Um, we started to do the integration with the TensorFlow for the object identification. Um, and then we re-enabled something that we disabled long ago for security, which was a way to say, Tika server, on the machine you're currently running, there is this file, 
please process it. Off by default for security reasons, otherwise you'd be like, hey Tika, on your current server, can you try passing etc. password and give me the text back? Thanks. <laughs> so it gives you a big warning, but if you know what you're doing, you can turn that one on. 1.15, um, we've got support for some new JPEG formats. We've got some more PDF box upgrades. Um, Tim's done some great work adding in some more of the old Microsoft Office formats. We've got WordPerfect, WMF, EMF, uh, improvements in the uh, language detection, um, and ongoing preparations for Tika 2. Um, and then when I did a call out to the mailing list for some of the cool stuff going on, this was what I got back. So if you're interested in the um, image recognition, natural language processing, all that kind of stuff, these are the wiki pages of the things that are still in progress and have just been finished that you can have a look into. So, Tika 2. First release, 2007. 1.0 release, 2011. Fairly often since then, people have said, hey, let's do a 2.0 release so we can do some breaking changes. And someone else has usually said, you know what, guys, we can actually do that without a breaking change. We've been really good at maintaining backwards compatibility in the APIs, and we've been able to shoehorn in a surprisingly large amount of new features without having to do that breaking change to the API for the 2.0 release. Um, so, if you do want to upgrade to 2, which is coming out, um, make sure that you compile against 1.14 or 1.15 and fix all the deprecated bits. Because everything that's currently deprecated in 1.14 and 1.15 will be dropped in 2. So things that might bite you is the really old style metadata keys, especially if you're on very old versions of Tika. We used to just do simple strings for the metadata keys. They've now been swapped out for properties where for a property we'll say, this is the Dublin core title and this is a single string. This is the Dublin core created at and it is a single date. So you know more about what those metadata things are describing. So make sure you drop out the old deprecated ones and move to the properties. Um, metadata storage is still up for debate. At the moment it is just string, string, which is really flexible, but sometimes surprising. Um, lots of people keep talking about richer models and nothing has been accepted, but there is talk of the underlying metadata model being made something that will support more structured types. Um, we have managed to shoehorn some of them in just by putting slashes and brackets in the string keys. <laughs> Works surprisingly well. Um, lots of people don't like it though, so that may change, but I suspect we'll still keep the backwards compatibility onto the strings if you need them. The metadata for video is tricky though. If you've got a DVD video where you've got the main video stream and the alternate director's cut video stream, and you've got English, English director's commentary, English for audio impaired, or sorry, for visually impaired, French, Spanish, South American Spanish, subtitles in English, French, Spanish, simplified Chinese. They're all logically this one video, but there's all this different stuff that actually goes into making up. And you might say, I'm interested in knowing if the French is in two channel or four channel or surround sound. I'm interested in knowing if the Chinese text is all there. I'm interested in knowing if the director's track has a different sampling rate but they're all still the same logical block. So we're trying to figure out what's the least surprising way to show you all of the different metadata of all of the different things that go into this one logical thing of, hey, it's a video, when it's lots of different things. And that's blocking a lot of the um, extra metadata coming through from the, uh, all the Vorbis and OG formats. We got the data, but we're just not sure how to expose that to you, the end user, without really surprising you. So if you have ideas, please let us know. Um, the big one that a lot of people have been asking for is packaging of the passes. At the moment, with Tika, you get no passes or 60 megabytes worth of passes, as long as Maven's behaving. 
Um, in the new one, we have much more modular passes where you have a group of passes for one logical area and you can say, I still want all the passes or I'm only dealing with text formats. Just, just give me the simple set of passes relating to those. And it means that at the moment where currently you say, Tika, I want Tika passes, but I want to then exclude all of these complicated dependencies to only get the things I'm interested in. You can just say, a Tika passer PDF, that's all I want. So these are the sets that we currently support on the 2.x branch. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and, and use those to just pull in specific bits of Tika that you're interested in. I don't know why Bob's taking a photo. He did this stuff. <laughs> Um, logging is all moving to SLF4J um, in the 1.x branch. There's a whole bunch of different logging depending on the parser being used, the person who wrote it, the age of the code. So, <laughs> pretty much. So, um, Constance has been doing some great work to go through and get it all using a single unified logging framework. Um, Config, some of this has been done on the 1.15 as well, but making sure that everything can be easily configured, explicitly configured, and consistent. There's still some stuff at the moment where some of the passes will run off of properties files, and some of the stuff will be done from the Tika config XML. We want to make sure there's just one place that you go to see your config, make changes to your config, and make sure that the defaults are sensible documented and no surprises. So we don't have the thing where someone says, I did an app get upgrade and Tika got slower. And we're like, ah, ah yeah, you just got Tesseract, didn't you? <laughs> They're like, but, but how did Tika get slower? And we're like, yeah, so maybe that's not the best default to have. So working through some of those things where the trade-off between batteries included and sensible, no surprises. Something we're still... You yeah. could have multiple default, you know, different levels of default, like Tika fast, Tika all. Yep, so one issue we've got at the moment is it's not easy to set fallback passes and different preferences. Um, we'd like to be able to say, hey, um, try this parser. If it fails, try this one. Try this parser then take the metadata, merge it in with the text that you get back from this one, and if they both fail, then try this one, but if only one of them fails, then consider it a good job. That's not very easy to do at the moment, so we want to make it easier for you to configure that in without surprising you. And then, yeah, the multiple passes. If there's two different ones that handle a format, how do you say which one to try? How do you merge the output of them? Especially if they both output some text, and you're like, well, I've got two different passes that say they think they've given me the header block. How do I kind of deal with deal with that? Um, then the parser discovery and loading. At the moment, it's a little bit magic. You just drop an extra jar on the class path. Tika finds it. Tika loads the parser. Tika starts using it. Um, and it doesn't tell you if you've got half a parser by default. So we're, I think we're going to set the default on two to be worn, where it at least says, hey, I've got half of the word parser and none of the dependencies, so I'm not going to use it, but I thought you should know, rather than just going, hmm, OK. <laughs> Sorry, no text for you. Um, probably don't want to set it to error, but you can do this already in the config. You can just do a, a two-line Tika config file that says, for my service loader, I want error. Do not start Tika if stuff is missing or warn. Just tell me what's going on. So you the audience, the users, what do we need your input on? One of them is Tika gives text through a content handler. And there's no easy way to rewind that and say, hey, you know how 10 minutes ago I gave you some HTML? I've now run it through the language detection, and I want to say that the title is in Spanish. You can't, you can't rewind the content handler to go back and augment that particular snippet of text with a language, or go back and say, that bit of text, that's talking about a place that's in Miami with these latitude and longitude. And we can't say, hey, I gave you three pages worth of text and then the parser died, so I'm going to try another parser. Can we just throw all that stuff away and try again? If you know of really good 
models for doing this sort of stuff that other people have solved tell us we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but it's currently looking like we may have to. So we'd like to know if there's other ways of doing a sort of streaming sax like thing, but also be able to go back and change things later. Then when we've got that sorted, we can try and do some of the content enhancement nicer. Things like when, you've, when you're processing this text, I want you to go through looking for place names. When we're processing this PDF text, I want you to more easily run it through Grobid and annotate things. And then also do the translation, potentially say, when processing this, I want you to do, for each line, do the Spanish and the English. Um, metadata, I think mostly we're okay there now with all the Dublin call stuff. Um, but if there's other metadata standards you think we should be supporting, let us know. The big thing we're still wondering about is the richer metadata, how we handle things like that video case with the multiple streams. Um, I'm almost out of time, so the slides are going to go up in a minute. If you're interested, I've got a whole bunch of slides here on how to make Tika scale and the kind of things that go wrong when you run Tika on significant portions of the internet and dealing with all the failures that crop up. So if you're interested in that, have a look through those slides. And yeah, tomorrow, 240 Brickle, which is the one just over there. Hear Tim talking about the Tika eval making sense of two terabytes worth of data and comparisons. Lunch starts in two minutes. <laughs> so, okay. When uh, Tika decides to OCR a document, is there any uh, massaging of the images before it's given, you know, squaring them up, changing contrast, etc.? I know TestRack behaves a bit better when uh, text is higher contrast or the image is squared. At the moment, no. We just hand off the raw image. I, there's an, oh, Tim wants to. Sorry. But the Tesseract is getting better. They're throwing redundant arrays of graduate students at Tesseract and <laughs> <laughs> some of that Maybe stuff that, that's a lot of that now. I haven't looked at it yeah. for quite a while, but. So rather than you having to do a lot of those pre processing steps in Python, it's now getting easier to happen. Is there a plan for voice to Um tell DARPA that they want it and we'll probably get it for free. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think the issue is that there's no free good libraries available and so it's going to have to be one of these machine learning things um, and that that's more than a week's work so we'll need to find a keen graduate student, get them set up on one of these things, build the training data set the same way that we've done with the image recognition. But if we've missed a really obvious library, please tell us and we can add it in quickly. But a lot of this stuff, it, it does take a lot of work to build those training data sets, build those training tools, build the model, and then it's quite easy to hook into Tika once you've got that model. And most of the existing models that exist are proprietary. I don't think we can really ring up Apple and say, hey, can we have your Siri language training set? And then they're a little bit tetchy about that for commercial reasons. So we end up having to do, do our own training and, and, and build it that way. So in the context of uh, scanning email attachments, like you mentioned earlier, is there any risk of executing malware uh, that happens to be in those attachments as Tika is running against it? No, it shouldn't be. It's all pure Java, fully re-implemented. So there, there, could be, there could be issues with it causing Tika to run out of memory. If you can craft the right attachment that triggers the right bug in the underlying libraries, you can get an out of memory um, or make it run really slowly. So that's why we often suggest that if you're taking in untrusted files, you have some sort of watchdog or retry. Um, if you're doing it on Hadoop and Yarn and things like that, be aware of the default there is to say, oh, the GAVM's died. 
I think it's the server. Okay, let's stop using that server and go and find another server and give it to that. And like, oh, it's died there. Must be a dodgy rack. Let me go and try another rack. Oh, I'm running out of servers here. <laughs> so you maybe need to kind of teach that that if something fails twice, it's probably not the machine, it's the input. Flag it as a bad one, move on. The other thing that said, make sure to keep upgrading with Tika because we have had a couple of vulnerabilities that were fixed. Um, so we had an object uh, serialization um, vulnerability and also XFC. Those are both fixed by Tika 1.14. Okay. okay, everyone hungry? Should we go? Okay, well, thank you for coming. <laughs>